The story begins with a couple spending time together on what seems like Christmas Eve. Later in the night, they lie together in bed, engaging in intimacy. The man Andrew gets seduced by his wife, Sarah, in a Christmas outfit. As they fool around, there is a sharp knock at the door. What a moment to interrupt. Andrew walks out to open the door. A man called Steve is standing outside. All he says is that he needs Andrew's help. The next thing we see is all three of them occupying the kitchen. Steve drinks a glass of water before asking where Andrew and Sarah met. He guesses it was in law school. Whoever this man is, he looks concerned about something. Andrew thinks it's a good idea to tell Sarah to go upstairs and put appropriate clothes on. He wants to have a moment alone to catch up with his friend. Steve thanks her for the water while she walks away. Now that it's just the two of them, Andrew blurts out his first honest words to his friend. He tells Steve he looks messed up, which is a statement Steve thanks him for. Andrew thinks it has been three years since they saw each other, but Steve quickly corrects him. It's actually been five. Andrew is curious to know what his longtime friend is doing here now. Steve wanted to see Andrew. Suddenly, he asks if Andrew believes in God. Andrew is surprised by the odd question. His friend prods him to answer. Andrew tells him maybe he does, meaning he's not sure about what he believes. Steve responds to that, saying Andrew's wife is nice. The latter agrees with him and says they are trying to have a baby. This makes Steve apologize for interrupting them. From their conversation, we learn Steve is a policeman. He also thinks he should leave because he does not want to mess up his friend's good life. However, Andrew says if Steve needs him, he is there for him. Getting somewhat serious, Steve asks Andrew to come with him. For some reason, he cannot tell Andrew what is going on, which the latter curiously accepts. In the bathroom, Sarah tells her husband she doesn't even know who that man is. Her attitude is now very different from how it was earlier. Andrew informs her that Steve was his college roommate. He talked about him previously. Sarah finds it odd how he arrived in the middle of the night. What's even more strange is that her husband has not heard from him in five years. Based on this, she can't understand why he wants to take off with his friend from the past on his first call to him. Andrew reasons with his wife, saying that Steve needs his help. Everyone always needs his help. Sarah disappointingly responds. She changes the topic to say that Andrew told her he was ready to have a baby. First, he told her they would do it after he graduated. Then it was supposed to be once they found a home. So she wants to know when the right time will be now. He just bluntly tells Sarah he needs to do this. He promises her that they will make their baby boy when he returns. The scene concludes with her telling him, It'll be a girl, not a boy. Upon exiting the house, Andrew tells Steve he is ready. His friend appreciates his help. Inside the car, he asks Andrew how he convinced his wife to let him go. Andrew merely says that he told her the truth. Steve never forgot about how Andrew used to help him all those times. Thus, he repeats that he appreciates his continuing help. The next scene shows the duo arriving at a gas station. Andrew enters the store whilst his friend pumps gas into the vehicle. Andrew yells out to the cashier, that the soda machine is broken, and she strangely acts oblivious to it. Outside, Steve watches a police car drive by with its siren blaring. Curiously, his eyes follow it. Andrew's eyes are also fixated on something important to him, a box containing a pregnancy test. At this moment, Steve briefly enters the store solely to tell Andrew they should go. As they leave, Andrew tells the cashier not to work too hard. Again, she answers inappropriately like she doesn't care about what the customers think. Once Andrew gets in the car, Steve drops a bomb on him. He casually tells Andrew that there is a lifeless person in his trunk. Andrew is rendered speechless. As they drive, Andrew wants to say something, but he doesn't know how. So Steve breaks the silence and tells him he's sorry. His apology prompts Andrew to rudely shut him up. Switching the subject entirely, Steve asks if they thought of any baby names. Suddenly, Andrew's mind starts to grapple with the absurdity of the situation, and he asks what Steve meant about there being a lifeless person in the trunk. Steve yells that it means exactly what it sounds like. When they stop driving, Andrew resorts to inspecting the trunk. He asks his friend about the identity, a question Steve struggles to answer. Then Andrew yells he does not want to know. He gets upset, reminding Steve he belongs to law enforcement. Steve claims that he did not plan for this, and it just happened. Andrew starts losing his mind that Steve showed up at his house with such trouble after five years. Steve keeps saying he's sorry. He wants someone to help him get out of this mess. Andrew points out he does not even have shovels before he closes the trunk. To solve this problem, the duo enters a hardware store. They collect two shovels, amongst other items needed for what they are about to do. At the checkout, Steve says he doesn't have his wallet. Therefore, his friend is kind enough to pay for everything. Following this, 
they arrive at a faraway location in the woods. Once they've changed into their special outfits, they start digging the ground to bury the stranger Andrew knows nothing about. As they are digging, Steve is troubled with Andrew not talking to him for hours. But Andrew maintains his silence. Steve can't take it anymore. He wants him to say something, even if it's something hurtful. Steve shares with Andrew that he is scared. After a few more silent seconds, Andrew simply says one word, Simon. Steve guesses that is potentially his son's name. He asks if his wife gives birth to a girl, what will her name be? Andrew tells him, it will be, Mary. Steve finds this interesting because that is the name of Andrew's mom. The boy's name reminds him of the game, Simon says. Suddenly, Andrew sees someone running behind his friend. The stranger strikes Steve on the head with a crowbar, knocking him out. Andrew falls out of shock due to witnessing this atrocity. He manages to collect himself and run away. The stranger, whoever he is, just looks at Andrew fleeing for his life. He runs scared through the woods, having left his friend behind. He isn't even sure if Steve is still alive. The man with the crowbar is now merely walking in the direction Andrew fled. When Andrew tumbles down a slope, he remembers being with Sarah outside. He gets back up and keeps running, while the stranger follows him calmly. Eventually, Andrew finds an area to hide near a stream. He keeps having flashbacks of being with his wife. Unfortunately, hiding does not help him, for the stranger finds him and knocks him out. In the next scene, Andrew awakens elsewhere, hearing a shovel scraping the earth. The stranger walks up to him, blocking the sun with his head. He barks at Andrew to get up. Try as he might, Andrew can't because of the pain. The stranger simply looks at him for a short time and silently walks away. Steve is lying still on the ground, appearing to be lifeless. Shortly after, Andrew is covered in tape. He helps the man toss Steve into the freshly dug hole. As they bury him, they don't say a word. Once they finish, they walk to Steve's car. The moment Andrew opens the trunk, he gets knocked out by the man. Switching the scenery, we watch the stranger walk in an interior space. He places a pair of gloves and a wallet on a table. He also has some time to shave in the bathroom. He follows this by placing a few tools on the table. Then he looks through the wallet, and a certain card grabs his interest. It makes him smile somewhat eerily. Soon he puts on the gloves he placed on the table earlier, and pulls Andrew out of the trunk. He puts him in a chair, inside whatever this place is. When Andrew wakes up, he looks around, completely disoriented. He's restrained to the chair, preventing him from having an easy escape. A whiteboard is in front of him with a very disturbing message written on it. It looks like a set of instructions about taking a person's life. Seeing such a message frightens Andrew. He moves around in the chair, trying to escape frantically. Yet all he does is fall back with the chair. At this unlucky moment, the stranger enters the area and starts clapping. He tells Andrew, they haven't been properly introduced. Despite him saying this, no introductions happen. He just looks at Andrew struggling on the floor, which he calls pathetic. He is considerate enough to pull Andrew back up, but Andrew uses this opportunity to thrust the chair back at the man, attempting to push him away. Then, he manages to walk with the chair to the assortment of tools and takes a knife to free himself. When the man runs at him, Andrew slices into him. Attempting to open the garage door, Andrew hears the stranger telling him to stop. He pauses and asks the stranger who he is. This prompts the man to rudely fire the same question back at Andrew. The latter wants to know what the man wants with him, a question the stranger has a hard time believing. He tells Andrew that he and Steve were digging a hole for him. Of course, Andrew thought he was deceased. The unsettling conversation reveals to Andrew that Steve may not have been his true friend. Now he's even more confused. The man goes on to tell him, that he stabbed an officer during the arrest for the assassination of his partner. He also says juries don't like people who take the lives of lawmen. This means he is throwing the assassination of Steve onto Andrew. At this point, Andrew demands that the stranger give him the keys. Ignoring him, the man says he hurt a lot of people. He tries to guess Andrew's occupation. After he goes over several possible choices, he decides that Andrew looks like a lawyer. The look Andrew gives the man upon hearing this indicates the man is right. Following this, the stranger flatly tells Andrew that he's going to lose his life today. Those are some of the worst words anyone can hear, but he needs a few answers before he can lead Andrew to his demise. Having had enough of this man's talk, Andrew runs up to him, only to get slammed back by the chair. The man reminds him that he hurts people. As he brings him down, the man says if Andrew does not talk to him, he will find someone who will. In the next scene, we watch Steve's car on the road while Andrew is in its trunk. He wakes up, trying to escape again. He eventually hears the car stop because the stranger got pulled over by the police. From the trunk, he hears a policewoman ask the man for his license and registration. 
He kicks the car a few times to grab her attention. Sure enough, the policewoman demands to know what that noise was. After kicking the inside of the car a few more times, he hears several bangs. The stranger either knocked out or took the life of the policewoman. With that done, the car resumes the journey. Soon, the trunk seems to open on its own, and Andrew takes this opportunity to jump out. He watches the car continue to drive on, before running into the woods. Soon enough, Andrew comes across a restaurant. As he enters, he gets a few stares because of his unusual appearance. He steals a random coat from the hangar, not being shy about it. Subsequently, he uses the bathroom to tend to his injury. He also undoes the tape all over him. Then he approaches a young couple, Dan and Melissa, sitting in their car, and asks if they could help him. He lies about having been in a car accident. Andrew lies again that his name is Greg. Lucky for him, Dan is an accommodating individual. After he invites Andrew inside, we watch them drive along a road. As they do, Melissa gives Andrew a phone to call whoever he might need to, so he uses it to call Sarah. However, he resorts to leaving a message, telling his wife he's coming home. Once he leaves it, Melissa asks him where he's coming from. Her inquiry causes Dan to tell her to leave the man alone, but he ends up asking him the same question. He was merely helping out his friend, Andrew claims. Melissa asks him if he did, and Andrew remembers the horrific moment of his friend's untimely demise. Lying would just feel wrong. Thus Andrew blurts out the truth, that he wasn't able to help his friend. Eventually, a truck drives up beside them. The driver is none other than the stranger who took Steve's life. Andrew sees him drive past them, and he's lucky he is wearing sunglasses. Perhaps the man didn't recognize him with them on. Shortly after, Andrew hallucinates that Steve is standing near the road. The hallucinations get worse, where he's struck fatally. To make matters worse, a woman on the radio starts talking about how a policeman got shot. She says the police are now in search of a man with certain features. The ones she mentions seem to match Andrew. When she says he has a broken arm, Dan and Melissa look at each other because the Andrew's arm is in that unfortunate state. Andrew is left with no choice except to tell his hospitable transporters that it wasn't him who shot the officer. He wouldn't do such a thing. He can't say who it was, for he does not know the stranger's name. Once he gets let out, he tries to use the payphone. No one answers it, prompting him to get angry. He catches sight of a girl and walks up to her, taking her phone to call Sarah. Alas, someone else answers it. So he gives the confused girl her phone back and starts running until he finally arrives home. Entering it, he sees the stranger sitting in the kitchen. He instantly points a gun at Andrew without looking at him. Not only is he in his kitchen, but he seems to have prepared himself a sandwich too. Looking at Andrew, the man asks if he's trying to figure it out. Then he opens a door for Andrew to see his restrained wife tied up with her mouth taped. The stranger tells him not to worry because no one has touched her. He invites Andrew to the porch for a chat. Andrew pleads to this man, who's probably no longer so much a stranger as he is an intruder, to let them go. However, the intruder likes the area and does not want to leave. He likes the remoteness of it. Andrew tells him again that they thought he was deceased. He doesn't even know who the man is. When the intruder thinks about his funeral, he says he cannot imagine a pretty woman like Sarah being there for it. She would not be crying for him, and the people there won't have to hold her back from the casket. He knows that would not happen to him. Andrew, however, would be in such a privileged situation. Due to the unfortunate circumstances in which they met, the intruder thinks he has become a part of Andrew's family. Andrew wants to know who he is, and the man reminds him he's a policeman. But soon he tells him he's not. On top of this, he emphasizes that he's not deceased. The intruder puts forth the possibility that maybe he is just bored. Switching the subject, he asks Andrew what he wants to be once he grows up. Since he isn't answering, the intruder brings Andrew's attention back to the gun. This means all of his questions must be answered. Andrew remembers being with Sarah during Christmas Eve. This memory makes him say that he wants to be a father. The intruder doesn't think Andrew can be a dad. Sarah is the one who could be a mom though. The man proposes giving Sarah a child, whom Andrew could raise. These words anger Andrew, to the point that he abruptly pushes the table between them to knock the intruder back. He rushes to him, and they start fighting. Sarah can hear the commotion. This gives her a chance to start undoing the tape that binds her. As the intruder gets the upper hand on Andrew, he asks him why he tried to bury him. Andrew can only repeat the truth. He thought the intruder was deceased. Now the man wants to know why Steve came to him for help. At this moment, Sarah appears to stab the intruder with a knife from behind. He knocks her down and painfully pulls the knife out of his back. Andrew is currently too weak to attack him for what he did to her. They both madly reach for the gun lying on the floor, and it suddenly goes off. It is revealed 
that Andrew got to it first to shoot the intruder, who falls into a rocking chair. It takes a few seconds for him to seemingly lose his life. At a different time, we see Andrew with his wife, burying the man in the woods. Sarah asks her husband who the man is, a question he doesn't have an answer for. We watch how the dirt starts to fall on the mysterious stranger. The scene changes to show a bar. Even though it never gets mentioned, the scene is a flashback of the recent past. The man sitting at the bar happens to be none other than the stranger. Shortly after, another man enters the bar whose name is Bill. He tells the bartender he misplaced his wallet. Hearing this, the stranger says he could get him a drink and wishes a Merry Christmas to Bill. He also tells the bartender he's okay with paying, for it isn't his money he's paying with. He even wants to buy four more drinks for Bill. This prompts Bill to tell the stranger he may be his new best friend. Correcting him, the man eerily says he is Bill's only friend. Suddenly, Bill catches sight of a wallet lying on the counter. Taking it, he realizes it's his wallet, and the stranger has been using the money in it to buy the drinks. The stranger gives Bill the latter's driver's license before saying, this is what happens when one does not pay their debts. There is a red cross over Bill's photo. The stranger concludes this confrontation by stabbing Bill in the neck with a sharpened candy cane. The bartender simply watches the act without reacting much to it. Interestingly, no one else reacts seriously to it either. Moving along, we see Steve sitting elsewhere in the bar. The stranger sits at his table, and we learn they have been working together. Steve is in some sort of trouble, but he tells the stranger he thought his debt was cleared, but he's mistaken. It will be cleared after he does one more thing for the stranger. Thus he gives Steve an envelope, from which he takes out a photo of Andrew with Sarah. Steve masks his expressions, pretending not to know who Andrew is. The stranger buys it, telling him Andrew's a lawyer, and has made friends with the wrong people. He also made several bad decisions. The stranger tells Steve that sometimes a person does not see things happen, despite them coming right at the person. Turns out, Andrew did not realize that the people who sent him here should have used more local trusted contractors. According to the stranger, Andrew has worked for the wrong law firm and has the wrong clients. The friends he's acquired have made all the wrong decisions. They've crossed the wrong people. Andrew does not even know about the bad decisions he has made. At this point, Steve puts the photo of his longtime friend back in the envelope and asks what will happen to Andrew. The stranger does not answer him. He just needs Steve to get him Andrew's name and address. He also wants Steve to make a smart decision. After the talk, Steve walks out of the bar with the envelope in his hands. Outside, he wonders what he should do and soon decides to burn the envelope. Then we see him open the trunk of his car and take out a pipe. Steve has decided to help his friend instead of the stranger, redeeming himself and marking the end of the movie.